You started out talking about money, um, 19 billion pounds on publications and 2.6 billion on drug development. You never mentioned Bill Gates. Yeah. This entire change in the, fina in the research into malaria has been driven by Microsoft Windows being so successful, mm -hmm. in, 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 in a nutshell. Um, so I think you know, if you're going to start with money, you should feature Gates, because I don't think Gates will go on forever. Gates could have decided to do something else, like try to get to Mars, like Elon Musk did. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Melinda Gates could have lost interest when she discovered that she won't actually eliminate malaria, which she famously announced about 10 years ago, that you know, she was going to eliminate malaria, and it's extremely unlikely. So I think you should address the money, how much this is costing, how much this sort of, um, I don't know, you know, what's this costing medicine for malaria venture is massive, massively funded by Gates. Mm -hmm. You, you make a really good point. Um, I, it was an oversight of me not to mention Bill and Melinda Gates, who do and have contributed a great deal of money to medicine, Medicines for Malaria Venture. Um, I, uh, seeing you know, this kind of investment in, in research into uh, medicines that, that otherwise wouldn't be explored is obviously extremely important for, uh, for the research. Of course, the reason that uh, Bill Gates has, has been able to give this money is because of a, a very successful business venture. Of course, um, and of course that's fantastic, but there are also um, other discussions to be had about, about the model of, of donating huge amounts of money um, from big organisations or from individuals, um, which of course is a fantastic thing for projects like this, but there are also some complications in thinking about um, the directions of other research projects and the things that um, individuals can choose to do with the vast amount of monies that they, that they have raised. And perhaps um, if some inv individuals were taxed more, then it would be a decision-making process about how that, that money was redistributed. So I think you're entirely right about Bill Gates. He's done some wonderful things, and Melinda Gates too. But in terms of... Um, what I said in my first slide about decision making, if we were to able to, to get more tax from some individuals, then maybe governments and the public could decide more about how that, that, that money is distributed. Um, <clears throat> hi. In a previous life, um, I used to um, advise uh, on the design and construction of research labs. And one of my clients was the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research, which were based in Switzerland, and was set up uh, by a, a chap called uh, Daniel K. Ludwig, who was the Bill Gates of the 60s. Um, and the, the uh, Ludwig Institute have research institutes all over the world. In fact, they have uh, one in Melbourne. Um, and they do a lot of research on an open uh, basis, as you're describing, until they got to a point about 25 years ago when they thought they had something that was worth treating people with, and they had to do clinical trials. So they have to go to drug companies to manufacture the drugs to do those clinical trials. Mm -hmm. And the first question they got was, where's the patent? Okay. Because without a patent, no drug company in the world will manufacture the drugs to carry out the clinical trials. How are you going to overcome so, that? Um, that's a, a really fantastic question. I think that actually um, we've we sort of got um, lost in the last uh, few decades with our um, this prerequisite for a patent. We know that many medical interventions earlier in, in last century, including the polio vaccine, was not patented. There are examples of, of life-saving medicines that have really revolutionised public health that weren't patented in the past. But I think, you, you know, of course, you make a very important point because taking a drug through clinical trials is extremely expensive. The hope here is that we have this problem. That would be the best problem we could possibly have as this project, is that we found a molecule that is so good 
that we now have the problem of how we're going to take it to the market um, without a patent. And I think that things are shifting. So certain discussions are shifting because if you have placed a molecule and all of the data that has been um, investigated in terms of um, whether it has any side effects, um, whether it is um, going to cause other problems or it's metabolically liable, or whether it um, has off-target effects or anything like that. If, you, if all of this data is completely and open and transparent, and experts from places like the malaria, Medicines for Malaria Venture, from pharmaceutical organisations who are all looking in on the data, say that this compound is a winner, then with the backing of a, of, of a team of people, perhaps there is an opportunity for governments or for crowdfunding um, these kind of trials in the future. And that's something that we, we really hope that we come up against that problem. I know it's been tricky in the past, but um, I think that there is, there is a possibility that we could bring uh, a drug to the market. It might not be our research project, but without a patent in the future. Um, and I guess we just have to keep on, keep on trying. Um, yeah, two things. First of all, you showed that only 1% or 1.3% of uh, the uh, expenditure on a drug was on the original research. You didn't show the timeline either. The timeline for that is you're looking at maybe the first two years, clinical trials the next three or four, and then to where my background is, building the uh, development plants and then building the full-scale plants. Mm -hmm. And that costs an awful lot of money. And if you haven't got a patent, what will happen? It will be built in the cheapest, nastiest production facility anywhere in the world. So you've got to be careful about this. Mm -hmm. um, second one is, uh, second question, the new antibiotics that we need, we've got to make them, but then we're not going to use them. So that's another sort of funding thing. You find a new promising antibiotic and you want that to treat a pandemic but you don't want to use it to feed cattle to make them fatter or whatever you want to keep that in reserve somewhere and you almost need an international organization to actually manufacture and store enough of that drug and there's no profit in it at all until you need it for some pandemic somewhere well i, I mean I, I i completely take your point I, had to, I didn't put the timeline up there and there are a lot of other costs the point i was trying to make really there was the difference between the marketing costs and the research costs. But um, all of the things that you mentioned, for me, uh, really further highlight that there's a problem with the model, there's a problem with the way that we do drug discovery, and that we really need to think about a way that we can find new medicines more quickly and more cheaply. Um, the, the, the UN have had discussions about this, um, the World Health Organization have had discussions about this, about the issue of access to medicines. And of course, this is something that affects all of us because we have drugs that are too expensive or do not exist yet for countries that can't afford to pay for them. But we see new examples of this almost every month of a, a cancer drug that was particularly difficult and expensive to make that is now out of the reach of, of, of people who need that drug. So one of the ideas that the UN had put together on a high-level panel that they published towards the end of last year was the idea of delinking the cost of a medicine to the customer or the consumer or the patient. It's probably a nice way to put it. Um, and the, the drug discovery company. So that the cost of discovering and developing a drug is not passed on in the cost of that medicine, particularly if it's an essential medicine for, for the patient. So I think... There's just, there are so many discussions and, and all of these points are really important, but they're all part of the same kind of discussion that we need to have um, about how we can improve this, this industry. I, I have a question, uh, which is, um, I know it's really hard to predict, but uh, is there sort of, um, is, is there a dis discovery that you kind of can feel that's like around the corner? Or when, like when will uh, a, a you know, malaria curing drug be discovered? Which might be an impossible question. That's but. a really tricky one. There are some drugs that are in, um, I think, phase two and phase three clinical trials. Um, so, of course, we're really hoping that those, those drugs turn out to be, you know, market leaders. Because the whole point is that we want a new malaria medicine as quickly and as cheaply as possible. There's a, a new, um, very 
demanding requirement for a malaria drug or a guideline for a requirement, if you like, that's been set by MMV, which is that a drug should cost less than $1 and it should completely treat malaria in one dose, which would uh, prevent problems of compliance. It would obviously be cheaper because you could give that to the patient when you see them and they, they don't have to administer um, or take drugs um, away. Things, problems with forgery and, and stealing them would be avoided in this case. So I think we have to watch the case, watch the space for these, these late stage clinical trials and, and keep our fingers crossed. What's the uh, scientific problem with, with finding out the structure of the, of, that, of the ion channel that you had mentioned in the, in the parasite? Okay. The, and, so, and, I, and I guess this is not also in the context of the prize that was announced today, the, the, the electron prize. Yeah. yeah. So that will certainly be a technique that will help the Nobel Prize for today, which I've, I've not had a chance to read too much about that today because I was a little bit busy around London, but um, I'm looking forward to reading more about that tonight. But um, this cryo CM is going to be you know, very important for, and already has been very important for understanding the structure of biomolecules. The reason that it's so difficult to understand or to obtain a structure for that particular channel is because it's a mem membrane bound uh, protein. And that means it's, it's really big. It's sitting in the membrane of a cell and it has very many different flexible and uh, different conformations. So essentially when you're taking uh, or finding a crystal for something, you're trying to almost freeze it at a moment in time or in some way bind it to um, something that causes, an active, uh, causes some activity at that site or prevents some activity so that it's locked and frozen in conformation. So it's just very difficult to crystallize this particular type of protein. It's not an area that I'm a specialist in at all and there are researchers trying to do it. So many of the, the models that are based on understanding the structure of this particular ion transporter are based on what are called homology <coughs> models. So other ion transporters that are from the same family and have some structural similarities have been crystallized and we know what they look like. So people will do docking where they'll take um, essentially a, a 3D structure that's computer generated, which is the actual structure of a known um, ion transporter. And then they will dock different molecules into there to see how they might potentially bind with a related uh, structure. But we don't have the crystal of the exact one at the moment. Which had mentioned um, the one from the Chinese medicine, right? And you said the molecule was, uh, for some reason, not, not very appealing because of the two oxygen atoms. I didn't quite understand why. Okay, so this is... Um, when two oxygen atoms are bonded to each other, because they're both um, uh, electronegative elements, so they love electrons, they love having electron density around them. So basically those two molecules are in a bit of a tug of war in that bond. So it makes it very vulnerable to, to breaking and to breaking explosively. Because essentially chemistry is really about electrons and who wants them more in terms of atoms. So in terms of that kind of tug of war, it can lead, lead to ex explosive uh, reactions, but of course not with these molecules. There's no way they'd be used for the treatment of, uh, of a disease and given to people if they were in any way dangerous. Explosive like, like TNT explosive or like? Well, um, I mean, this molecule isn't, but you know, uh, pretty explosive. So peroxides are what these molecules are called. So for example, you may have heard stories of, I think in the past when people were having their hair dyed and peroxide vapor filled the, the air of a salon. If somebody went for a cigarette, you could suddenly have a, a big bang. And it's because of this kind of, this kind of bond between those molecules. Some other questions? Okay. I've worked mainly on HIV, HIV prevention. I'm not a, I'm not a, a chemist or a scientist. Um, HIV has been transformed. It's been amazing in the last 30 years. I mean, it's kind of a completely new phenomenon, uh, a plague, an epidemic. Um, vast amounts of research has gone on. Has it, in what, do you know, in which, and it's been relatively successful. I mean, new drugs have emerged through the commercial chain. I think mainly thanks to the promise of lavish funding to purchase those drugs. 
Uh, and although Bill Clinton claims a lot of credit, it was actually George Bush who really put the big US money behind the purchase of HIV drugs for Sub-Saharan Africa. So the bulk of the money there. So uh, have you, are you aware of considered comparisons between that point about uh, commercial companies will develop drugs if um, the publicly funded research is available, which I guess it has been in, mm -hmm. um, in HIV. I mean, it's a, a really amazing story of, of drug development, successful drug development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the, the you know the, the speed at which um, uh, the which therapeutics for HIV have developed is really very is really really a phenomena. Um, and you're right; it really is a matter of of money. The, the amount, the right amount of money, being being thrown at a research uh, problem or project. Um, and so there has to be this will and all the right level of intervention at the right time. And of course, that has happened with malaria this you know this decline between 2000 and 2015 it's because of huge amounts of money and interventions by people or funded by people like Bill and Melinda Gates who've gone for drugs for nets for insecticides for education um, education is often the most important part of, of these of these programs so I mean if the if the right amount of money was was thrown at malaria and um, there are even more people were researching this, then I'm sure there would be a medicine much more quickly. But there hasn't been this, the comparable, you know, amount of, of, of funding put in. Hi there. Um, you might have picked this up, picked up on this earlier, but you're talking about um, the issues of resistance, and I still think personally that the issue what you really have is the actual publication will, as you described at the start, where you were saying how that. And you were talking earlier about how people really are like collaborating together. But what about the amount of groups that aren't collaborating, who are actually in active competition with each other? And I wondered, like, how can you overcome that? Well, I mean, if the if groups in competition with each other have um, a molecule that's looking good, um, there's nothing to stop that that going forward. But I agree with you. I think the problem is that you see this all too often: two research groups competing for something. The race for the prize, you know, the the great flaming lip songs a bit a bit about this, but this kind of ra this race to achieve something, and that has been productive in in many respects because it has encouraged people to work harder and longer hours to get to the desired result. But the the problem for me is that they could be doing something else, or they could be doing that together. So. There is a lot of collaboration in science. It's important not to understate that. Um, but there are still, of course, competing research groups who don't share data. And, and I think that's something that we should discourage. We should have prizes for things that are collaborative. Or maybe we should think about having a prize or maybe even the Nobel Prize that isn't just for three people. Or, you know, things like that. There, there, is, there is still this really strong um, ethic from the top in science and the way that people are rewarded is that it's best to get there, there first. Um, but really, I don't think that's the most productive way for society. So I have, a, I have another question. Uh, you clearly have sort of such a passion for chemistry and organic chemistry. I was wondering, uh, what's the most fun molecule to make? Or like the most fun you've ever had in a lab was when you... Well, um, so I think one of the, the most fun molecules to make was actually a similar molecule to the one that the students are not allowed to make for the synthesis of Daraprim. Um, I used to work for, um, I won't name it, but I used to work for a water board every summer um, during my undergraduate degree. And it took me about a month to realize that this chemical that somebody very ha happily handed over the preparation of every single morning to me was this extremely explosive um, <laughs> compound that was used to um, derivatize or kind of break down molecules in water samples so that you can detect whether there are certain types of pollutants in the water. Um, and um, apparently, well, when a supervisor came over and saw that I'd been doing this for maybe four weeks every day, they were a little bit horrified. But the fact that I still had both of my hands meant that I continued to do it for the, the rest of the time. Um, as an organic chemist, there is also some joy when you make something that's colourful, because organic chemists um, usually are happy if we make something, well, that's yellow or a little bit brown and hopefully white and, 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 and crystalline and pure. 
but the inorganic chemists tend to have all the fun because the colours are because of metal complexations within molecules. So if we ever get to make anything with a metal, it's always a good day because you can sometimes get some pink or blue crystals. So, yeah. Are there any more questions? This is not really a question, it's following up something I was saying before. You were saying that a drug, or people were saying that a drug wouldn't be manufactured unless it was patented. But if you get a useful molecule, I think maybe what you need is some sort of licensing arrangement where I know, half a dozen institutions in the world are licensed to make that, but nobody else can. Mm -hmm. So you need some sort of legal mechanism equivalent to a patent that says, all right, this drug is freely available, but we're going to manufacture it here. and the very cheapest manufacturer, I don't know, wherever, Taiwan, is not going to be able to uh, compete and, and all the funds that have gone into your production facility somewhere else become useless. Mm. The other point, I'm an organic, well, I'm, a, I'm an actual water treatment chemist, but uh, I'll tell you the most interesting thing I ever did was when I was at Glaxo's development lab, I uh, finished up cutting up s sticks of lithium metal, putting into a... Uh, 500 litre Fowdler vessel full of liquid ammonia with a full spacesuit on. And when you drop this first piece of lithium metal in, the whole of that ammonia grows bright blue, blue. and this radiation from electrons. Absolutely fascinating. You've never done it. So that's one of the, the most famous um, reactions that's named after an Australian chemist. It's the birch reduction, which, and the reason you see this blue colour is because you have the formation of um, free radicals. Um, and this is um, a chemist that Australians are particularly proud of, so I just thought I'd mention, mention his name today. Um. Uh, sorry, also to, to mention uh, the, an RI link with Australian chemists is uh, William Lawrence Bragg, uh, the, yeah. of, uh, you know, Bragg's Law of Fame, was born in uh, Adelaide. Yep, and there's, again, there's lots of things downstairs that everybody should go and have a look at. Um, yeah, there's some, there's some fantastic Australian chemists. Can I ask a final question about the, about the software? Mm -hmm. um, so it looks, it makes it look terribly easy yeah, for you. Yeah? Um, if um, if a colleague, who, I, I noticed the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine is not on your list of, and they're big researchers on malaria. So, so if somebody at the London School wanted to come in, would they be? perfectly comfortable with all this or with their, and their, their, their system administrator wouldn't say, no, 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 you can't, you, you can't have that. Well, um, there's no barrier to accessing everything. Everything we use is open source software. So the idea is that anyone can, can use the software to take part in the project. Because if we had a barrier with our software, we, we'd be you know, in a bit of trouble there. Now, different universities may not like the idea of researchers using it because sometimes there are, I mean, universities um, want to protect um, just for intellectual property. I um, forgot the, <laughs> the phrase that, you know, very, it's very important to universities to maintain some of the intellectual property because a lot of money is spent by universities to, to facilitate research. But we haven't found that. So we've, there may be some people who haven't, who have, you know, who haven't collaborated because their universities have, have, um, forbade them, but in the way that we've been using it, people have been comfortable to contribute and to join in, and, and people from the pharmaceutical industry who are retired or current, um, chem informaticians, uh, biologists, all types of researchers, and researchers at every level, so from high school students using the same platform as professors, so, so far, not too many problems. I think that's a fantastic place to end uh, with a call for anybody uh, with any sort of uh, interest in chemistry to maybe sign on and see uh, what's going on in the Open Source Malaria Project. Um, so yeah, thank you all very much for coming and thank you, Alice, for a wonderful evening. Um, and just remains for me to, to thank you one more time and ask for a, a nice warm round of applause. Thank you.